Okay, our first uh, paper that's going to be presented today is Combat Associated Pancreatic Injuries, 2002 to 2011, presented by Captain Michael Clemens. The senior authors on this paper are Colonel Lauren Blackburn and Lieutenant Colonel Christopher White. Thank you, sir. This one. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. We have uh, the standard disclaimer and no disclosures. So we've all heard the age-old surgical adage of eat when you can, sleep when you can, and don't mess with the pancreas. This is typically because the pancreas is a temperamental organ associated with a high mortality rate, ranging from 12 to 46% in all cases of abdominal trauma. It's also an uncommon injury, occurring in approximately 5 to 7% of cases of all abdominal trauma, making it unfamiliar. And it's often associated with a penetrating injury in approximately three quarters of patients. Because of this, over 99% of patients have some sort of associated injury, typically to the liver, stomach, kidney, spleen, or colon. And there's often a wide range of associated named vascular injuries, which has been independently associated in the literature with an increased mortality. Once these patients move to the operating room, they often have damage control procedures ranging from 20 to 77%. That 77 comes from our limited data from Iraq and Afghanistan by Dr. Vertries and colleagues. And in the civilian literature, if we look at the patients who had damage control, they are further associated with a higher mortality rate. Once we move to the operating room, there's a plethora of choices described in the text. These typically uh, are boiled down to pack, drain, or resect. Patients who are solely packed have a greater than 70% mortality rate. Approximately half to three quarters of patients will undergo drainage of the pancreas as their sole operation. And approximately a quarter will require a distal pancreatic resection. The trauma whipple remains elusive in the 2 to 5% uh, range of these injuries. So this brings us to what are the lessons learned in current uh, procedures for combat. The current combat casualty care guidelines suggest hemorrhage control, debridement of devitalized tissue, and wide closed suction drainage. It's specifically listed that pancreatic duodenectomy should not be performed in an austere environment. These recommendations are generally echoed in emergency war surgery and frontline surgery, sir. <coughs> So this brought us to our question of what is the incidence and outcome of pancreatic operations occurring in the combat environment, in the Rule 2 and Rule 3 environment? And so this study was designed as a preliminary pilot analysis to identify those patients and operations which are occurring and at what rate they're occurring so that we can design future studies that will look at specific injury patterns and specific operative um, therapies. We performed a retrospective review of the Department of Defense Trauma Registry from 2002 to 2011 including all U.S. service members who underwent an exploratory laparotomy in the Roll 2 and Roll 3 environment and had a 24-hour survival. So this crudely removed patients who had uh, unsurvivable injuries and also given that we are looking for patients who are having extensive pancreatic resections and reconstructions, we hypothesized that these would not be occurring in the first 24 hours. We excluded all non-U.S. personnel including DOD contractors and four patients were excluded for inadequate medical records. We identified our patients with the use of the 52 prefix on the ICD-9 procedure codes. We note that multiple codes are specific, such as distal or total pancreatectomy, but multiple codes are also nondescript as other operations of the pancreas. Further, there is no ICD-9 code for drainage of the pancreas. Overall, we identified 1,248 patients who underwent an exploratory laparotomy and met inclusion criteria. 5% of those patients, or 62, had a pancreatic injury identified on laparotomy. Of those, 37 patients did not have an ICD-9 code specific to the pancreas, and 25 or 40 percent did have a, a pancreatic procedure specifically performed. When we look at this cohort as all of our patients, those who underwent a pancreatic procedure and those that did not, as with some similar military studies, we find a very homogenous population of young males who have approximately two-thirds incidence of explosive injuries, approximately one-third penetrating, and the remainder being blunt. We have an even distribution of two-thirds of our patients in Operation Iraqi Freedom, all of which are severely injured with a mean ISS of 30 or greater and a mean AIS for body region 4 of 3.5 or greater. Approximately half of our patients required a damage control procedure. During their initial laparotomy, multiple procedures were performed. We do see a slight bias uh, toward an increased number of splenic operations in our pancreatic group. This is likely explained by the association of splenectomy and distal pancreatectomy. We further find that there is a median increase of one procedure being performed simultaneously during the initial laparotomy in this group, also likely a similar explanation. We do like to note that 
Uh, we have 100% survival in this cohort to Rolf for the Rolf for environment, and similarly in the Dr. Vertry studies, they have 100% survival to hospital discharge. When we look at our patients broken down by ICD-9 codes, we find that 40% of our patients, or 11, underwent a distal pancreatectomy. Four are noted to have undergone a total pancreatectomy, and no patients were noted to have had a trauma whipple in the Roll 2 or Roll 3 environment. We find this association interesting, and we further broke down the demographics of this populace. We find, again, that they are young male patients. But interestingly, our total pancreatectomy group has a higher propensity for a blunt mechanism. Obviously, there is a, a low end value in this group. We further find that we have a higher number of distal pancreatectomies occurring in Operation Iraqi Freedom, and that we see a clinical difference in our ISS scores with 44 being our mean in the total pancreatectomy group. The small numbers uh, prevent this from holding up to statistical scrutiny. So overall, we find that combat-related pancreatic injuries are very similar to civilian trauma in that they are a rare incidence occurring approximately 5% of injuries. The specific Pancreatic procedures occur in approximately 40% of those patients, which is a similar incidence as well. All these patients are severely injured with a mean ISS of 30 or greater. And our distribution of operations is similar, with approximately one-fifth of our patients requiring a distal resection and a low um, 5 to 7% requiring a more extensive operation. When we look at what's unique to military operations, often it is the high degree of explosive trauma for our mechanism of injury. We do have a high early survival rate with the caveat of excluding the first 24 hours of injury. And so all of our patients who met these criteria were evacuated into a Rule 4 environment. We do find the uh, ICD-9 of total pancreatectomy versus a trauma Whipple to be very interesting. We think that this either represents a non-surgical third party involved in the coding of these procedures, or it could represent a cohort of surgeons in a combat environment avoiding a pancreatic anastomosis and having an extensive injury proceeding with a total pancreatectomy. We think this is worth being further evaluated. There are multiple limitations to the study, the most glaring of which is its retrospective nature, but we're severely limited by the preliminary data set that we're using to define this patient population. We're uh, specifically looking at a role two and role three environment to see what type of operations we are performing in combat. And at the moment, we don't have operative reports available, so we're missing double AST uh, grades of injury. We're missing surgical thought process and anatomical locations of injury. We think this will be very useful as we continue on. Further, the reliance on ICD-9 codes it depends on the person inputting the data, and we suspect that this might have an impact on our total pancreatectomy group. In conclusion, we find that combat pancreatic injuries appear to occur to a similar incidence to civilian trauma. 7% of patients with an extensive injury in a combat environment do have to go uh, undergo a more extensive resection. So when we look back at the combat casualty care guidelines of don't do a Whipple in combat. Um, some portion of patients are requiring more extensive resections. The question is, is there reconstruction happening perhaps later? We do find there's 100% survival of patients who had a pancreatic operation in theater who survived the first 24 hours of injury. And we are currently pursuing a two-pronged approach to further studies to evaluate these patients looking for access to TMDS to get operative reports, to get more detailed AAST criteria, anatomical locations of injury, and to pursue outcome data beyond the 30-day range available in the DODTR. Uh, often the complications of pancreatic trauma, such as fistula, uh, pancreatic pseudocyst, will persist beyond the 30-day time frame, and so we're looking into other avenues to pursue outcome data that will find those patients appropriately, and we'll be able to better compare our cohort to civilian data. I'd like to acknowledge the work of my co-authors in here as well as my PI, Dr. Blackburn, and the assistance of the, uh, the ISR and the DODTR for data extraction. I'd be glad to take any questions. All right, this paper is open for discussion, and yeah, you can also submit questions through the uh, app, if you like. Thanks for the talk, that was really helpful. I know after looking at all these records for pancreatic injuries, it's very hard for this injury in particular to identify the, um, the AIS, um, the ISS score, and, and such like that. And I completely agree with you that, that we're looking at data problems <clears throat> because total pancreatectomy, you could easily find that number by talking to major medical centers we have gone to. We've not had one single patient come back with a total pancreatectomy. We did complete one um, at, at Walter Reed, and I highly recommend against that. Don't do a trauma Whipple. 100% agree after taking care of someone who suffered 
tremendously from that decision. Um, it, I just want to emphasize that. But you know, congratulations for tackling this. It's tough. Like I've done it myself, so I know the problems that you're dealing with. Um, you know, but thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you very much, ma'am. We are very interested in trying to better elucidate what's exactly happening with those specific patients in our follow-on studies. Thanks. Great talk. Um, I'm going to piggyback on those comments and just ask if you would briefly mention a couple of the hurdles you're, you're trying to overcome with respect to doing the deep dive in the data to get that long-term outcome, because that seems to be a chronic problem with we've got mountains of data and follow-up and the ability to capture trauma patients, but we can't get access to the data. Could you just speak to that? Of course, I'd be glad to. Going forward, we really have a two-pronged approach right now. One is we'd like to pursue a more extensive retrospective review, which will allow us to move from the pre-hospital environment through to the Rule 4 environment and include the 30-day outcomes that are currently available in the DODTR. We'd like to use that also to compare the operations occurring on U.S. service members versus local nationals who are not evacuated from theater. That data is generally available within the DODTR, but to better understand what's going on with these patients, we require access to TMDS or WHISPER, and that's been uh, an, expen an extensive IRB approval process even though the majority of surgeons have access to it from the combat environment, uh, getting the availability to use it for research as a resident has been difficult. Um, further, we find that once the patients move on beyond that 30-day time frame, beyond what's available in the back end of the DODTR, they tend to be moved to multiple MTFs. And so the IRB prefers that we have ALTA records individually approved in each MTF, making it difficult to get a, a DOD-wide spread of follow-up of these patients. Our other option that we'd like to pursue is actually considered a prospective analysis in that we'd like to contact the patients themselves. Now that we've identified there's a relatively limited number of them, um, we'd like to actually call them, offer them VR36 questionnaires, ask them about their nutritional status, uh, complications, but because this is new data that would require a prospective IRB. So we, we do find there are significant hurdles in understanding the exact data that's coming out of this environment and getting the follow-up on the back end. So, so that was very nicely presented. Um, wh why did you decide to only look at U.S. service members? For now, we recognize that there's a difference in the aeromedical evacuation process associated with U.S. service members versus local nationals. And we, we specifically wanted to start by identifying how are we treating our own that are going through the aeromedical evacuation process? What operations are we performing in a combat environment in a patient who has the ability to be evacuated to somewhere that might have ERCP, MRCP, or more support. Uh, our next IRB, which is currently being reviewed, does look at uh, local nationals, DOD, and coalition forces as well. Okay, yeah, I'd encourage you to look at that. When you're talking about incidents, you really want that piece. When we publish these series on just U.S. service members, we're missing over 60% of the injured patients we see usually at least. But, uh, yeah, that'll, that'll be great incidence data, but you're right, the follow-up piece then, you pretty much have to look at U.S. because we obviously we don't have local national follow-up for most of these. Yes, sir. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Excellent. Thank you, sir.